Thursday recap, weekend streamers, and Arizona Fall League rosters. Up next on the final Kokomo Friday of the season. Alcantara, Soroka, you look so good in Boca, Peralta, Manoa, Bounce Back, Ferrer and Nola, Chilito, Castillo, Yoshida, Mosu, Sikta, Cardo, and Fado. Now you're so high, but any piece so low. Frank Clubs, tips up kind of show. Now let's get on with the show. Happy Kokomo Friday and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on September 29th. I am Frank Stanfield, joined by Scott White and Chris, the Welsh. Last in-season podcast of the year. We made it, boys. Scott, our fourth year together. We've done three and a third seasons together. I don't know what you call 2020, but we did it. Oh, it was 2020 was a grind once it started. That was uh, two and a half months that felt like six. But yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's hard to believe it's been that long. I don't know. It's easy to believe it's been that long. I feel like I've been doing it with you forever. I feel like that's just what you're supposed to say. Hey, there you go. We've done it. Uh, yeah, 2020 was crazy because I started late March, took over for you know Adam Azer, who's I think the best to do it. And uh, yeah, like. The whole world was shut down. We're trying to figure out what to talk about. Uh, well, like there's no baseball or anything going on in the world. So that was a fun time. We eventually got a season in and here we are three full seasons later. Tons of fun today on the show. We'll recap Thursday's action final weekend streamers. And we will talk about some of those prospects who will be in the Arizona Fall League for this season. Let's recap Thursday. Oh, my good goodness gracious. I had to get her in there. Final one of the year. Susan, oh my goodness gracious. Scott, you got a chance to talk. Let's go to the Welsh player of the night. I feel like that has been the number one uh, sound clip that has played when I have been on the show this season. I'd have to go back. I won't. And go back. I feel like that's been the number one. I've heard it the most. Which is I think you should go back. There's you something about you that just reminds me of Susan Waldman. Well, so. I, I can see it. I guess I can totally see it. My demeanor, I suppose. Uh, for my, oh my goodness gracious, how about the Jesus lizard, Jesus Lizardo? What a weird and inconsistent. You know what's so funny? We I think we all kind of like go about this like it's been an inconsistent year. You actually want to know what? It's actually been relatively consistent with one amazing month that was put in it because it has been kind of not the greatest. He did have a 328 uh, ERA in June. He had the 193 in July, but it's been sandwiched between a whole bunch of weirdness 592 in August and it's kind of continued over the last uh, couple starts where he had this incredible brave start and he's giving up five runs, giving up six runs and then tonight he goes out, you know, with just a couple starts to go goes seven and one third strikes out 10 walks one leads baseball in uh, swinging whiffs at 22 today and he went really heavy on the slider and it's something that love to monitor how he does this in the off season because the the slider already had a 50 percent whiff rate on it for the year and he was using it around 28 he went over 40% usage in this game, and he had 18 swing and whiffs with the slider. It was that dominant version of Lazardo. And I don't know, I think he's a very heady pitcher. He, you know, will change up, kind of quick pitch people. He's got a couple different ways in that um, Johnny Cueto mold of being able to screw with people. Maybe just needs to simplify some stuff. I hope he can take these brilliant flashes that he shows because these are flashes of like top 20, 25 SP, 10 strikeouts going seven, and they get mixed in with this grossness that pops out. But 22 swing and whiffs, a very, very good time in your playoffs. You were saying, you're like, oh, but I was thinking when you're playing bad in fantasy, you want fantasy baseball to go away. <laughs> you want it to be 2020 again. You're like, I don't even want to look at baseball. Some of the pitchers, if you started like Ryan Yarbrough today, you probably wish baseball didn't exist. Jesus Lazardo gives you a little bit of hope, and he was pretty awesome and a good way to carry into 2024. Yeah, and you know we're getting to the point now. Obviously, it's the final week of the season where numbers – have finalized for some starting pitchers. Like this is the last start for Lazardo. Finishes with a 363 ERA, a 122 whip, 10.5 K per nine. 
2.8 walks per nine, 14% swinging strike rate. There's no doubt that he has the stuff, the makings of being a potential fantasy ace, but we, we still see that inconsistency crop up and, and lots of hard contact at times. I think we kind of know who Lazardo is. We've seen it the past two seasons now, Scott. You know, he's kind of volatile at times. He's probably best suited as like an SP3. My guess is he is ranked somewhere near the top of the glob next year. Yeah. I, I think oh. he has the upside to transcend that if he can ever find some consistency. Well, that's why he would rank at the top of the glob. So he'll he'll be in my top 30 next year. I'm pretty confident saying. I mean, I don't even know that I hold the some of the ups and downs this year against him because that's been true for every single thing. I mean, it's been true for Spencer Strider. It's been not true for Garrett Cole, I guess, but it's true for almost everybody. And, um, you know, he had a three-start stretch at the beginning of August, Luzardo, where he allowed 16 earned runs in those three starts. Scott, turn your mic towards you because it's doing that thing again where it's not really picking you up. Okay. All right. Is this better? You got me now? Do you, you read me? I'll let you know. Just keep talking. And if something happens, I'll, I'll yell at you. Yeah, we're, get real comfortable with that there, Scott. You're real close on that. Yeah. So um, Lizardo had his three-start stretch in early August where he gave up 16 earned runs. But apart from that, his last 18 starts. Uh, so three of them, he gave up a combined six earned runs. But in the other 15 of them, he gave up uh, 19 runs in the other 15. So I, I don't know. Like ERA close to 320 overall during that 18 start stretch. I, I think he's, I don't think he needs to get much better. I mean, it'd be nice if he did. It would be nice if he was a true ace for us, but he's, he's pretty much a, he's a pretty awesome fantasy pitcher as it is. Yeah, I think it's especially in a Roto League where you just kind of take the totality of the stats and look at it at the end of the season. Again, it's it's been a quality pitcher for Lazardo. You know, the way that we got there could be a little frustrating at times, but for where he was drafted, I, I think you're pretty happy with what you got from Jesus Lazardo overall this season. Scott, player of the night for you. Player of the night for me is Cole Reagans uh, facing Detroit. The end result was pretty disappointing given the, the opponent. He allowed four earned runs in six and a third innings, struck out eight, but, but walked four in those six and a third innings. And I, I've, I've begun to notice some, some cracks, some cracks in Cole Reagans here to close out the season. I know shocking. Uh, so I mentioned the four walks in his final four starts. He had a combined 16 walks. So average four in his final four starts. He had three total walks in the previous four starts. So at the height of Reagan's mania, he, he looked like he had totally whipped that control issue. And then it came roaring back here at the end. And if you look at his track record, uh, majors and minors control had been an issue for him. So maybe we were too quick to, to say it's not going to be an issue for Reagan's anymore. Um, on the other hand, it is possible. One, one of the trends I've noticed is that it seems like the Royals are leaving him in too long. Two of the four walks came in the seventh inning and all four of the runs came in the seventh inning. And in fact, three were uh, allowed in by a reliever. They were inherited by the reliever and who, who let them score. So, I mean, Reagan's, if, if they had pulled him after six, his stat line would have been amazing and we would have all been celebrating uh, another great outing, him, him ending the season on the high note. So you have to take that into consideration as well. Just are the Royals managing him properly? And then the final thing I've noticed here, he threw just nine sliders in this start. He threw 10 in his previous start. That was compared to him throwing that slider like 15 to 20% of the time at his best when the Royals first called him back up and he was dominating. That slider was credited. It was, it was basically a new pitch for him, and it was credited with kind of bringing his entire arsenal together. It was his best swing and miss pitch on his own, and it seemed to make the rest of his arsenal better. And so why did he 
why did he stop throwing it so much here at the very end? That's confusing. And considering it wasn't, you know, a firm part of his arsenal, it makes me wonder, is he going to stick with it? So there, there's, there are questions being raised here at the end of the year with Cole Reagans. That doesn't turn me off of him for next year. But I do wonder, is he a lock to be in my top 20? Because I'd been saying, you know, for the last couple of weeks, oh yeah, the way he's going here, top 20 pitcher for me next year, for sure. Uh, now that, you know, those cracks are showing, and obviously he's a pitcher for the Royals, so wins are, you, you got to think they're going to be car hard to come by. Is is he someone that we for, should for sure draft over Jesus Lazardo? For I was instance? literally going to ask you that question: was who would you rather have next year? Right now, I don't know that I'm ready to say, but I, I think the fact I'm reconsidering it uh, is telling in its own right. Yeah, I noticed the same thing, Scott, and it's really just the control, which again could be caused by leaving him out there too late in his starts. But four plus walks in four of twelve starts with the Royals. And, um, you know, I think if he can keep that together based on the swings and misses that he got this year, uh, obviously it's a, a great ballpark to pitch in, not that he'll get a lot of run support with the Royals. Uh, mm -hmm. But even with all those walks, 12 starts with Kansas City, Cole Reagans finishes with a 264 ERA, a 107 whip, 89 strikeouts, over 71 and two-thirds innings. So sure. I think there's lots to like as a breakout uh, candidate for next there season. is there is, is but is it is it going to be like christian javier was this year where everybody was so sure of the breakout that they were pushing him up into like the top 15 pitchers where he could only disappoint basically and he did disappoint i don't but, think that will be reagan's but uh, i could see that happening with Tarek scuba <laughs> but but wait let me ask you that yeah well i think also part of that might be about pitch stuff like cole reagan's is a five usage pitcher with double digit pitches and Christian Javier is just a two pitch pitcher. And if you have one fail it, like you're, you have to have such a dominant set like Strider does to be able to consistently. And we saw him be inconsistent this year. I think that separates a little bit, but let me ask you, what is different about Lizardo struggling and being like, nah, it's good. Uh, how much he doesn't need to be any better. And Cole Reg, I mean, Cole Reagan's, over his last seven starts has only had two bad starts. And like you said, he went six going great in this game and the seventh inning kind of ruined it. But leading up to that five and two thirds struck out six, gave up two, went six, struck out seven, gave up none. His pre actually his three starts from September 4th down to August 23rd. He had, he had a quality start giving up zero earned runs and 27 strikeouts in that time. So my question is just like, what is different about Jesus Lazardo's inconsistencies are fine, but Cole Reagan's aren't. Is it just, there's not a track record to Cole Reagan's to you? Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing we're we're assessing we're we're putting a lot on how many starts did you say it was frank 12 12 with the royals, the royals yeah. yeah 12 for a guy who's had two tommy john surgeries already and who the rangers didn't even think was worth putting in their rotation you know uh As they, they, they put traded him to get a role to chapman yeah um so it, you know we just we just don't have a lot to go on and yeah, I mean, you make the point he has a much fuller arsenal, Reagan's does, than somebody like Christian Javier. But as I said, it was the slider that really brought it all together that that allowed him to take off. And so so much of it does depend on that one pitch because he was he was the guy the Rangers didn't think was worth putting in their rotation before he had it. Yeah, I, I guess the only thing I was I was really getting at there was more about like if Reagan's costs more than Lazardo, I think like what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But I, I guess it was picking a yeah. little bit of like Lazardo. We're like, hey, Lazardo's fine, but we're not now. Like, there's a lot of worry that's being put out about a pitcher that this is the first time they really got to be they were thrown into this mix of being a starter. He they, he absolutely dominated. He was great. A little bit of mismanagement as he's learning to do it. I want to give him a little bit of a pass, but if yeah. it's if it's switched well, and Reggins is going higher, just to throw out, I just did an early mock draft I'm doing right now. Lazardo actually went in the ninth round and Reggins went in the eleventh round. So, you know, oh, that's surprising. That's yeah. Surprising. I mean, it may be a little bit. Anybody later. in the industry who's who's uh, hyped Reggins more than me, it's it's Nick Pollock, who of pitcher list, who of course is has a lot of influence on how pitchers are valued specifically. 
yeah. uh, throughout the industry. So um, that, yeah, I mean, as always, it comes down to how they're being valued. You know, if, if we're just doing a raw comparison, is this pitcher better than pit, this pitcher? Uh, then I'll, I'll certainly take a positive stance on Reagan's. I, I like a lot of what he's doing and I like his potential. Um, but if it's, you know, if he's, if he's bumping up against some really high end pitchers on draft day, then it might be more appropriate to take, take the negative stance and like, yeah, there's a lot more risk with this guy than some of these others you're passing up for him. And I think he went lower than he probably should have in this draft. And to the fair point, there's always that it's like, what's that family guy bit where it's like, uh, Hey, you want a boat or you can have this mystery box. And he's like, Oh, it's a mystery box. It could be anything. It could even be a boat. And that's kind of like the same thing with Reagan's where it's like, you do know what Lozardo is. And it's like, well, Reagan's could be really cool, but he could be Jesus Lozardo. But I think we also kind of dream on this potential that maybe he could be a little bit better as well. But again, I'm not picking cause I'm with you. If Reagan's is costing inside top 20, I think you are, depleting a lot of the return value that's possible, especially with a Royals pitcher in general, the early case for it doesn't seem to be that, but we do know that that's going to like wildly change as the season, yeah. as the off season goes on. And, and if there's one thing I can say, commit to for sure, you know, yesterday as recently as yesterday, we were like, ah, who would you rather have next year? Tarek Skubal or Cole Reagans? I'm pretty sure I'm going to say Skubal at this point. Skubal went ahead by, he was the pick before Jesus Lazardo in our mock draft, by the way, he was one pick ahead of Lazardo. I, I like that these guys are going in the round nine to 11 range though. That's, yeah. that's very yeah. uh, encouraging. Uh, how, how big was the league? Uh, this was a 12. It was meant to okay. be a 15. So, okay. you know, Even probably so. bump up a little bit. So probably more appropriate, like late seven, early eight. Well, I mean, we're usually 15. talking 12 team leagues. It's yeah. still encouraging. Uh, Welsh, can you uh, send those draft results to me by any chance? Yeah, buddy, I got you. I got you, baby. I yeah, I want to see what's going on. That that hey, that sounds pretty good to me. Scooble, Lazardo, uh, Reagan's outside the top eight rounds. Uh, let's... Yuri Perez, by the way, went the one pick before Scooble, so it went uh, Scooble or it went Perez, Scooble, and then Lazardo. And Lazardo, that went right in front of me. All three of those pitchers were on my yeah. queue for the ninth round. But yes, I will share that with you. And we can talk about it in the offseason. That's a fun thing to talk about. Yeah. I know baseball's winding down for a lot of people. But the other cool thing about fantasy baseball starts where we get to speculate on 2024 till our till we're sick. Till we're, we we want to cry. There's tears in our eyes because we can't handle it anymore. All right, my player of the night. I'm going to quickly talk here about J.D. Martinez. And he didn't do anything out of the ordinary. Two for four with his 32nd home run. I just wanted to highlight, and I did this last week, but he's been even better since then. He's got six home runs over his last 10 games. And now in 110 games with the Dodgers, 32 home runs, 100 RBI, 100 in 110 games. That is almost impossible. That's how good J.D. Martinez has been. He's up to a 302 ISO on the year. That's fourth best among hitters with at least 450 plate appearances. It's also the second highest mark of his career. And this is a guy that he was like a borderline first round pick in fantasy baseball drafts, like a couple of years ago. So just pretty awesome resurgence here for JD Martinez uh, entered Thursday, averaging 3.3 fantasy points per game. The same amount as Alex Bregman, Austin Riley, Rafael Devers players. We think about as like second round caliber in a points league, third round caliber in a points league. So that's how good J.D. Martinez has been um, on a one-year deal. Scott, what do you think the chances are that J.D. Martinez heads back to the Dodgers this offseason? I mean, pretty good. It, it probably depends on, you know, are the Dodgers going to be the highest bidder for him? The Dodgers have been highly speculated to be in on Shohei Otani, so that would kind of true for, preclude the possibility. Um, so... I don't know. It's it's hard to say. I could definitely see it happening, but I could definitely see it not happening. Yeah, I I guess Otani's like out of sight, out of mind right now, but you're right. The Dodgers seem like the heavy favorite favorite to wind up with Otani. I'm sure almost every team in baseball will try and get Otani this offseason, but the Dodgers are at the top of the list, and if that happens, obviously J.D. Martinez would not be back with the Dodgers next season. Uh, before we hit our first break, just a reminder of what's going to happen here in the offseason. Again, this is our final podcast of the regular season. We're not doing a normal weekend recap this Sunday, but in the offseason, we'll have two podcasts per week. Typically, that will be Monday and Wednesday evening live streams on YouTube like we've done all season long. 
And then the podcast will be in your feed the following morning. So Tuesday and Thursday uh, next week, because I'm actually flying out to Poland on Wednesday. I've got a wedding. Um, we're going to be doing this Monday and Tuesday. And then every week after that, it'll be Monday and Wednesday in the off season. So just a heads up there and a big thank you to everyone who's been with us all season long. There's, I don't know, like 89 people watching us here on one of the final days of the baseball season. We appreciate you being here. Hit that like button. Make sure to subscribe. Stick with us. We're, again, we're going to have awesome content this offseason. And a big thank you to everyone who's listened and watched and supported us all season long. Can't do it without you guys. Let's take our first break. When we return, we're going to talk about uh, some weekend streamers, the hitters with the best matchups, and uh, some pitchers that we might want to stream as well. We'll do that right after this. 100% awesome. We make this look good. 100% hilarious. <laughs> 97% on Rotten Tomatoes. That's so dope. And you still haven't watched Ninja Turtles on Paramount Plus yet? Y'all not as cool as I thought you were. Oh, no, no. Hey, man. Hey, Listen, hey, hey. we were kidding. Ninja Turtles is effortlessly cool and crushes for absolutely every age. Jeez, Dad, you really went buck wild there. Ninja Turtles, rated PG, now streaming on Paramount Plus. Welcome back in. Let's talk final weekend streamers. Hitters to look at the teams with the best matchups this weekend. This is according to me. And a little <laughs> peek behind the curtain here. Every time that we do the sleeper hitters and sleeper pitchers throughout the year, that's all Scott. So I went out and I uh, did my best Scott impersonation here. And uh, these are the teams and the players that I came up with for the final weekend of the season. Obviously, the Twins. They're in Coors Field. As of now, they're facing one lefty, one righty, one TBD. Carlos Correa will not return this weekend after all that kind of hoopla and talk. Uh, it's, Willie it's Cash. There's been a lot of that going around. Yeah, there has. Um, I think. Smashed a lot of players that amounted to nothing. <laughs> Willie Castro, Ryan Jeffers, Kyle Farmer. Those are the players I think will be in the lineup, at, if not every day, then probably at least two of the days. Uh, but Edward Julian. Matt Walner, Alex mm -hmm. Kirilov, I think they're interesting. They're playing well, but there is a lefty on the schedule, and there is a TVD, so it kind of throws a wrench in things here, Scott. Well, according to roster resource, uh, it's going to be two righties and a lefty. So I went ahead and moved Edward Julian in, in, in one of the leagues where I can make midweek replacements. I moved Edward Julian in and Christopher Morell out. Um, Matt Walner, I think, is probably going to start all three of those games just because they, they tend to start him even against lefties and um you know of course field he could do a lot of damage any of these guys could but those are the two i'm most interested in using julian and walner all right let's go to the other side of that series that's going to be the colorado rockies obviously facing the twins in Coors field and it looks like there are uh three righties on the schedule for the twins. So Rockies players, you could look at obviously Charlie Blackman, who had a huge game here on Thursday, three for five with a sock and a shoe, two runs and two RBI in that one. Ezekiel Tovar plays every day. Brendan Rogers has been playing every day. They're all under 61% rostered. So if you're looking for weekend streamers, I think those guys are fine. And uh, I don't know anybody else interesting here. Welsh, like an Ella Harris Montero or Brenton Doyle in the final weekend. I mean, I think you kind of sig signaled the guys. Uh, Montero's always interesting if you're in a big power chase and uh, simply because they're in Colorado. So I could be interested in that. But like if, you know, if Tovar were out there, Tovar's way. Rogers, though, too, I want to throw out, like he's been hitting a little bit higher in the lineup as well. So there's a really good op uh, RBI opportunity. So I dig those, but I'm, I'm probably not, unless I'm in a desperate power situation, there isn't like a Nelson Velasquez out there. I'm probably not looking at Montero. Blackman, I think, is the the biggest yeah. from the Rockies. Uh, his, his home splits are like Charlie Blackman of old. Yeah, it's a going away party. Probably probably around too, 900. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the next team up that I have here, the Angels are facing the Oakland A's this weekend. There's two lefties on the schedule, Ken Waldachuk and J.P. Sears. The righty that's kind of sandwiched in there is Joe Boyle, who's actually looked pretty good for the Oakland A's recently. Uh, but I think some Angels hitters you can look at, Brandon Drury, Logan Ohapi, uh, Randall Gritchick, Joe Adele has hit pretty well since returning, and Zach Neto. Uh, a couple other teams here, ones that I'm not as excited about, but the Braves are facing the Nationals. They have three righties on the schedule, so I think we should see Eddie Rosario a lot this weekend. The Yankees are facing the Royals. They're going up against Jordan Lyles and Zach Greinke. That's 
two of the three pitchers that they're facing. So I think Austin Wells, he's been pretty hot if you need a catcher. And then the Marlins are facing the Pirates pitching staff. Looks like there's two righties and one TBD. Let me pull up their roster resource and see. It looks like Quinn Priester, Andre Jackson, and Osvaldo Beto. So three righties on the schedule for the Pirates. I think Jake Berger has hit well. Josh Bell, obviously. Brian De La Cruz. Had yeah, just had a three-hit game here. De La yeah. Cruz on Thursday. And Scott, we've got to mention John Birdie. The YouTube chat last night was clamoring for us to talk about John Birdie, who, to be fair, he is on a crazy run right now. He's been super hot. So if you want to continue to ride the hot hand, Marlins obviously have some great pitching matchups this weekend going up against the Pirates. I think John Birdie is in play there. Some some serious players are going to get cut, by the way, for John Birdie. Just everyone pay attention. Yeah. And we get, you know, those like transaction pages we can look at. Just look at the players that are going to get cut for John Birdie over the next three days. It's going to be mm, playoff fantasy baseball at its peak. I I will go ahead and predict a bad weekend for John Birdie. Ah, oh, how dare I'm, you? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to put it out Cooler. there. If he, if he blows up in your face, I don't want it to be my fault. Mm, YouTube uh, chat, make sure to leave all your. <laughs> Your comments about Scott and his couch, and, and because he cursed the name of John Birdie this weekend. He's been stealing many bases this year, and that's all he's good at. He's had he has four home runs in his last five games. Come on, how much how much more power is John Birdie going to give you than that? He's done like a season's worth of damage in five. Games. Well, to totally not trying to pander to the chat, but as a resident John Birdie guy, clearly here, I would disagree with it. it's not all that he does. Uh, Scott, he <laughs> has multi hit games because he's got five of them over his last eight. So as a John Birdie guy, not pandering to everybody, I don't know if he is really good. I think I'll take the credit. And if he's bad, don't blame Scott. That's how we'll do someone this. in the chat. Someone in the chat said more like John Bogey. Mm. Oh, like geez. <laughs> mm. uh, John Birdie also kind of a slugger recently. He's got like four homers over his last just one, two, three, three, four. Five, Did we just six. catch you not listening? Uh, maybe. I don't know. Well, no, you were talking about multi-hit games. No one talked about how many homers. I, I did no, multi-hit games. Yeah. He talked about. I talked about the homers. Oh, all right. Um, well, listen, not, as my, not as my like fellow, I haven't been caught not listening. As my fellow co-chair of the John Birdie Club, Frank Stamfel, I'm going to strike that from the record. Don't worry. Uh, everybody just praise him and I when Birdie goes off. All right. So we normally save the uh, to stream or not to stream for the end. Scott's obvious favorite segment here on the podcast, but. <laughs> You know, people who are listening, uh, I wanted to get to this earlier than usual because you need to know. You need to add these guys now uh, in order to get your, your mitts on them for the final weekend of the season. So we will start with Friday. And these matchups are according to MLB.com. There's still lots of TBDs out there. And I think there's probably a lot that could still change too. So maybe take it with a grain of salt. Um, but for Friday... Uh, yesterday we talked about this and we weren't too excited. I think we pointed out Cal Quantrill at the Tigers, John Means against the Red Sox, and Nick Pavetta at Baltimore mm -hmm. as the uh, three to target on Friday. And if you need strikeouts specifically, Pavetta's number one. Quantrill, he'll, he'll probably get more strikeouts, Pavetta, than Quantrill and Means combined. He might get twice as many strikeouts as Quantrill and Means combined. I, I think these two going up at, uh, against each other are kind of interesting too. Ken Waldachuk going up against Chase Silseth. Yeah. Waldachuk has pitched well recently. The Angels are obviously without Otani and without Trout, so they're not really throwing the best lineup out there. And Silseth looked good. I just don't know how much they're going to let him throw. It's his first start off the IL. Uh, Welsh, any interest there? Yeah, Silseth is kind of a strikeout chase for me. I think that is one, that's one that you could end up playing. But, I mean, to your point, he's he's pitched – Seven total innings over his last two starts. A lot tougher matchups. I'm going to just throw this out. I don't know. Maybe I wasn't listening and, hear you, and heard you say it. I know there's a worry about how deep, but Nick Martinez might be a desperation play. Uh, the White Sox haven't been great. Brandon Fott lit him up for eight. I mean, obviously they won today, but they lit it, he, uh, he lit him up for eight. Nick Martinez, over his last two starts, has gone seven innings, giving up zero earned runs, three hits, and eight strikeouts. And I think this might be a play because the White Sox have been on an absolute downtrend. It did help the other day when Moncada and Tim Anderson didn't play, but they're really inconsistent. 
I'm not advocating to throw him at the top of the list, but if you are in desperation play and some of these great options are not out there, I might look to Nick Martinez. I don't know if you're going to get a win. That's probably the biggest problem. But if you are trying to, uh, you know, try to get some zeros up there with some strikeouts, maybe he's an option. On Saturday, the top names that I see here, we've got Jose Quintana up against the Phillies, Mike Clevenger against the Padres, Clark Schmidt at the Royals. Yeah, I mentioned Joe Boyle has looked pretty good so far. He's, you know, big old dude. I think he's like six foot four. He throws extremely hard. He's at the Angels. Six foot seven, by the way. Six foot seven? I must be thinking about there's another big pitcher that came up recently that's like six foot four. But yes, Joe Boyle, six foot seven. Big dude, throws hard. Uh Connor Phillips has been okay. He's at the Cardinals too. What do you guys think? I could get down with Boyle. Again, I think this is just like the Martinez one I mentioned. Like, this is a strikeout play. I think it's dangerous. All of these guys, that's kind of the point of the guys that are available to you are all kind of dangerous, unless it's the guy at the top of the list on Sunday. Um, But if I am trying to have a Hail Mary and I'm playing for strikeouts, I think I could get down with Boyle. He went six in his last. He struck out five, uh, gave up five hits, but no earned runs, and he hasn't done it over his last two starts or his first two starts in the majors. So, yeah, Boyle could be a strikeout uh, Hail Mary play. Scott, anything on uh, Quintana, Clevenger, Clark Schmidt? Revenge narrative for Clevy? I think Quintana and Clevenger would be the two I'd most likely start from this group. They're probably the two most rostered already, mm-hmm. uh, so they might be, you know, they they might be unattainable for you. But that's why, <laughs> because I think they're, even though the matchups are shaky, uh, I think they're the most likely to give you six strong innings. And then on Sunday we have the crown jewel. Just pick him up now if he's available. I don't. He probably isn't. But Michael King at the Kansas mm-hmm. City Royals. That is obviously the number one streamer of the weekend, and we've talked a lot about. A lot about him recently. Some other names. Uh, Bailey Ober has looked good, but he's in Coors Field, so I'm like, uh, final yeah. week, final day of the season. I don't, I don't know. How, that many, I, you, how many of these projected Sunday starters do you think actually pitch on Sunday? Well, they're already on MLB.com. I mean, I guess there's a chance it could change, but looking at it now, these are all teams, not the Twins. These are mostly teams that are out of it, so I don't think that they're going to change who's pitching on those days. Hope if so. that makes sense. Yeah, so. no, I hope so. Uh, yeah, I mean, Mitch Keller, they just shut him down. The Pirates just shut, shut him down for the season. He's not going to make his second start this week. Thankfully, he gave you a quality start in his first turn. Uh, and we warned you. I mean, you know, you can't count on anybody actually making two starts. And so you got to keep in mind, is the first start alone worth using this guy? Uh, and, and that's it's played out that way with Mitch Keller. Um. But the fact they haven't announced King as being who are, who are we concerned about? Oh, I'm just saying, like in general, I, I'm thinking when you're looking at we're talking about three days of streamers that we're sure. giving everybody here, and then you get it, it is a little bit of a bummer that the literal best option is on Sunday. And going through these, I guess my main point would be I would be much more hyper aggressive on Friday Saturday starts. I know it, there's something about like all right, going into the last day, let's see what I need. I would rather use my moves if we're talking about daily transactions on these guys that I have a real choice, uh, which is Friday and Saturday, because I think a bump could move them back. And yeah. I don't know, I just feel like you have the world better in your hands for fantasy on some of these options. Because I also think these options stink. Outside of Michael King, these these are the stinkiest of all of them. So I don't know. Uh, I don't want to not suggest them. I kind of like Ober. You know, fly ball pitcher at Colorado is dangerous, but he's, he's fastball changeup primarily. So he's not going to get his, uh, his breaking balls uh, so they're not breaking, you know, that's not going to be an issue for my, for Bailey over. So I think he's, I think he's my second favorite from the entire weekend, actually behind King. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> there you go. To stream hey, or not to stream for the those, weekend. Those Dodgers pitchers at Coors Field sure worked out. I win the, those balls got to break, man. But I uh, worry, I worry about, I don't want to break your balls here, but I'm a little bit worried about that start. So <laughs> okay. uh, let's talk about a few players here for uh, next season and what we're thinking. Someone that we really have not talked much about at all this year, and probably for good reason, is Dalton Varsho, who went one for three with his 19th home run on Thursday. He is batting just 220. He has 16 steals, a 675 OPS. Plate discipline basically in line with where it was last year. Uh, some things with the the batting average, a career high fly ball rate. 
and a career high 19% infield fly ball rate. Those are automatic outs. So I think it could explain the BABIP and the batting average being down. He's also been terrible in Rogers Center in Toronto. 177 batting average, a 555 OPS. Welsh, I know that you got to watch a lot of Dalton Varsho up close and personal with your Arizona Diamondbacks. Now with Toronto, will not have catcher eligibility next year. That that's that is the lead because not if he's not catcher eligible, yeah, I, I think it's going to be tough to. Write. You know what the weirdest split of all of it is? I remember in this trade, it was like, man, you know this this lefty thing. Like he struggles against lefties. Last year, uh, he hit two twenty one against lefties. Twenty six of his twenty seven homers last year came against righties. Well, then you move into this year, all of his homers, all eighteen homers came against le uh, righties again, but he's hitting 200 against righties while hitting 297 against lefties. What a wacko split that he has. Just, I think it's massively inconsistent. He can get some counting stats, but uh, you know, when you start to look at like the leaderboards of the amount of guys that are putting up 2020 seasons and you know, the 30 plus, you know, 25 plus Homer guys and 25 plus stolen base. Like Varsha's just at that bottom of the list that I, I just don't think the little extra homers and stolen bases that he give you, he gives you are going to be worth the down tick in his overall production. And he's also not a catcher. So I'm going to have probably minimal interest unless he shows some big signs and to hit as well as he did against lefties is such a major adjustment. And that gives you hope, except what happened with righties this year? And maybe you're going to have to learn to have a better distribution of power that literally, I mean, quick math, there's a 42 homers, 42 of his 43 homers in the last two seasons have come against righties. That's mm -hmm. weird. I mean, it's not get that weird as like a split guy, but it's just, it's someone I don't tend to count on and I won't it's, count on. It's platoon concerns. It's a bad ballpark for a skill set. I mean, that's, that's been, it, Toronto's looked like a tough place for, for, to hit it out to right field basically and he needs pull side he doesn't hit the ball especially hard dalton varsho he needs to get home runs to his pull side and uh <laughs> it would be it would be a stretch to say he's going to be uh 100 drafted next year if those weren't the case now that he's not catcher eligible but then you add that on top of it and i just don't I mean, it's it's a fifth outfielder in deeper leagues, I feel like. That's how we're going to regard Varsha next year. At best. So I am looking real quick at park, park factors for this season. Left-handed power. And uh, Toronto ranks 22nd. Um, which might not sound so bad, but Rogers Center, as, as recently as a couple of years ago, it, it, this was a hitter's park. And now with some of the adjustments they've made, it's not. And it's especially bad here. For lefties. So, yeah, I think there's not really much working in the favor of Dalton Varsho. What about Spencer Torkelson? He gets to the 30 home run mark here. Uh, one for four with that 30th home run here on uh, Thursday. Hitting 233. Obviously, we wish the batting average was a little bit better. Mm -hmm. XBA is 251, according to StatCast. So, perhaps we could see some uh, positive regression next year for Torkelson in that regard. But he's got 87 runs, 93 RBI. 758 OPS. I mean, this was one of the top prospects in baseball, and he's kind of coming through on it, Scott. I know you're currently working on your first base rankings for next season, uh, but do you think Spencer Torkelson will be drafted as a starting first baseman in fantasy next year? I'll give you where I rank him in a second, but first, we're just talking about uh, Dalton Varsho playing in a bad park for his skill set. Spencer Torkelson. At, on the road this year, hit 246, 20 homers, and 816 OPS. At home, 217, only nine home runs, a 687 OPS. Yikes. That park, like like for so many other Tigers hitters over the years, it, it, it kills them. And it's unfortunate, um, but it's, it's not going to change. So having said that, I mean, I do think he – I do think he's a pretty good bet for 30 homers next year for – 90 RBI at least, 85 plus runs scored. I mean, he's, he's, I think he's a starting caliber first baseman. I do expect the batting average to come up some as he continues to develop. I think his upside, though, in his home environment, I mean, that home environment is going to cost him five to 10 home runs a year as long as he's playing there. 
uh, and, and you look at his expected home runs by ballpark. I mean, there's some places he's just hitting 37, 40 home runs this year. If That's what I was just there. going to look at. That's so funny you did that. I was like, I got to see what that expected is. And it hit it. You're, you're not wrong about that. There's like 37 with Atlanta, 40 with Cincinnati, 36 with the Cubs. You're, yeah. It's very real. Yeah. So I have him 11th. I have him 11th in Roto Leagues, a little lower in, in point, uh, just one spot lower, 12th in points leagues. Um, I think in Detroit, Spencer Torkelson's upside is limited to like the Christian Walker range, where if he played anywhere else, he might have Pete Alonzo type upside. Mm. It's a good point there on uh, on Spencer Torkelson. I looked at, again, those park factors according to StatCast. Comerica Park over the past three years, dead last in home run park factors. So yeah, again, this kind of proves that uh, a terrible place to hit for power uh, are our poor guy, Spencer Torkelson. Some quick news and notes before we get to our final break. Tanner Scott was activated from the paternity list ahead of Thursday's game against the Mets and looked like he was due for a save opportunity. The score was 2-1, to one, and then what happened? Rain suspended. So my guess is uh, they'll pick that up again on Friday, but I'm sure they have to face different teams to be completed on October 2nd. They're going to complete the final inning of a game of course. after the season has ended. That is hilarious. <laughs> but, I mean, there's some huge implications here with the Marlins, right, in the in the NL wild card. Wow, that's, that's pretty crazy stuff. Uh, Paul Goldschmidt has missed back-to-back -back games with back tightness. Carlos Correa, as we mentioned earlier, will not return in Coors Field this weekend after all. It sounds like they still expect him back for game one of I, the I have, wild card I, round. I have to interrupt here. So... That game scheduled for Monday, October second. You said that that last inning. Yeah. How many championships? How many fantasy championships are going to be decided by that last inning on Monday? Tanner Scott, right? Man. And obviously the Mets have like Pete Alonso and Lindor. Like somebody could hit something. Something could happen. You What's know? the line? Is it that? Is that the lineup? Is that the turn? Like Let's that see. would be fascinating to see if it's like Tanner Scott and it's like Lindor, Pete Alonso. It's the big dogs. Uh, because I mean, it could go to extra would, innings. It's a two, one game. That's a good point. But like the big dogs up, that's a real, like real point to what you're saying, Scott, like you get like, like everybody's going to have Alonzo and Lindor in their lineups. That absolutely could be a deciding factor. Now, if it's, you know, the back end, uh, maybe, maybe for Frank though, Mar Mauricio, uh, actually the previous inning in the eighth inning, Ronnie Mauricio and Pete Alonzo were the final two outs. So I, I think Lindor is going to lead off the ninth. Yeah. Well, it's here's the other thing. If if this game has no impact on playoff implications, do do they even is it, like is it for sure they're they're going to get together to play yeah. that last inning if it doesn't it's matter for anything? Not. Yeah, that's they just, might not if there is none. That's just what it says on MLB.com for right. now, but well, that's we'll a little that, bit of drama, a little bit of drama could, for you. That could that could be crazy. <laughs> they all just show up back to uh Queens, New York to play one inning of baseball. Dude, I feel yeah. so bad for commissioners because like we see wow. these people. There's going to be a guy that is going to be screaming at the top of his lungs if they cancel that. I didn't get my last Pete Alonso. Cancel the fantasy season. I should get it. There's going to be some freaking out. Just, I don't know. Give some extra love to your commissioners if that is the case and they do cancel that game because I wouldn't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about this for, I don't think anybody wants us to talk about this forever, but what? there's a team with a lead. Why wasn't, why wasn't it just called? I was thinking know, the same thing. Official actually. game. Is there some kind of rule like if a team, if the, if the lead changes in the last inning of play or something? Is I, something I mean, we're missing. It might be the yeah. implication. It might be the playoff implications, that, to be honest with you. That's the only thing that I'm thinking of is that the game is quote unquote important, right? For Yeah, maybe September they don't do this. I don't that know. It seems subjective. I mean, right. <laughs> Looking back, a random game in July may make all the difference if it's called after five innings. Yeah, no, you're you're right about that. Uh, next up, Chris Bryan has missed three straight with an illness. <sighs> Luisa Rise has missed four straight with a left ankle sprain. Jeff McNeil was placed in the IL with a left elbow sprain, which was later diagnosed as a partial UCL tear. So we'll have to find out more about that in the offseason. Garrett Mitchell was activated by the Brewers after all. He went one for one with a double and two walks in his first game back. Brian Anderson was designated for assignment, and uh, we had a bunch of pitchers getting shut down before their final start this weekend. Brandon Woodruff and Freddie Peralta will not pitch for the Brewers. Mitch Keller will not start on Sunday, and Logan Webb will not start for the Giants. 
Let's take our final break. When we return, we'll quickly run through some of the top prospects competing in the Arizona Fall League this year. We'll get some thoughts from both the Welsh and Scotty on those, and we'll be back right after this. Freddy, surprise, Dad. What's going on with your son? I wish I knew. I've got a girlfriend I've never even heard of. When I told him I wanted to spend more time with him, he said no. It's just not a good time. Have you considered that he hates you? <laughs> Don't sit there! Those are Christian Lacroix pillows. So we can't sit on the couch? Not in jeans. <laughs> Welcome back in. Let's talk about some of the prospects to watch in the Arizona Fall League this year. I know the Welsh will be out at a ton of those games as soon as next week. So here are the 10 that are ranked inside MLB Pipeline's top 100 that will be out there in the AFL. Colson Montgomery, a shortstop with the White Sox. Carson Williams, a shortstop with the Rays. Ricky Tiedemann, a starter with the Blue Jays. Harry Ford, a catcher with the Mariners, Jackson Job, a pitcher with the Tigers. Kyle Manzardo, first baseman with the Guardians. Jace Young, second baseman with the Tigers. Kevin Alcantara, outfielder with the Cubs. Uh, Chase DeLauder, outfielder with the Guardians. And Kevin Parada, catcher with the Mets. Welsh, off the top of your head here, just these top 10 prospects. Who are you most excited to see in the Arizona Fall League? Uh, hands down, Ricky Tiedemann. Ricky Tiedemann is like, I am appointment watching getting ready for that. Whenever that start is, I'm going to make sure I can try to get over a try. At least he'll have a couple starts in here. Ricky Tiedemann is probably the most important to me just because yeah, he was for the majority of the season. And he's still in that same space as my number one SP, a huge, huge strikeout upside. There was a lot of arm issues. There was a real serious concern early in the year that that thing that kept him out might be like really serious, like Tommy John serious. Didn't seem to be the case. He is going to get his innings back up here. I'd love to see him go five. He's a eight strikeout in three innings type of guy. Um, I, I'm most excited about Tiedemann. I've seen a few of these guys. I've seen Colson Montgomery. I've seen Manzardo. I've seen Ford and Alcantara. Uh, a lot of those guys. But Tiedemann and probably Carson Williams. That's the other one. I've been... I'm a, been a little pokey at Carson Williams and people are like, why don't you have him higher in your ranks and like stuff? Him. Yeah. It's a strikeout. Pres- I like, I literally get tweets like, why you people have him in the top 25. I don't, he's got big counting number type of stuff, but he's also registered over 30% K percentages at low levels. So I'm very excited to see him in person and see what that swing and whiff rate looks like. The AFL is not like the greatest place to determine those things, but I will say it's actually one of the better pitching years we've had in a long time. We have we have multiple pitchers that have hit the majors that are on the roster. Darius Vines, who just threw for the um, Braves, is scheduled to come here. You've got guys like Job. He's not gonna be on. He might be on the playoff. Roster. He might be, but he's scheduled to come. Uh, Angel Zerpo with the Royals is coming out. There's so multiple multiple major league guys. Job, Jerpy, Tiedemann, uh, Dylan Dodd. There's actually really good pitching. So. Getting to see Carson Williams in action, I think, is really going to just kind of help make some of the determinations on the big prospects and like really how high he should go. Because like you said, Scott, like there's it's kind of two camps. It's either like I really don't like the swing and miss in this guy's game or you are completely discounting that this is a 25, 25 guy easy and he's one of the best, most exciting bats. That, those are the camps. I don't want to put too much stock into AFL numbers, but Scott, I think a really interesting name on that list, too, is Kyle Manzardo who is yep. a first base yeah. prospect with the guardians who uh-huh. came over in that Aaron Savali trade mid season. And there's a chance he's on the opening day roster for the guardians next year. Well, yeah. And I, I, I think what we see from him in the Arizona fall league will go a long way toward determining our attitude toward Kyle Manzardo next year, because it was pretty disappointing what he did in the minors. So 2022, Still in the Rays organization, Kyle Manzardo hit 327 with 22 homers, 1043 OPS, almost as many walks as strikeouts. And this year, between the Rays and Guardians, 237 with an 802 OPS. Uh, but if you look at the underlying data, I mean, the exit velocities are still amazing. All the plate discipline reading is still amazing. Like it doesn't look like there's a great explanation for why he his his production suffered. And so I'm inclined to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, if he has a huge Arizona Fall League, I think everybody's going to be inclined to give Kyle Manzardo the benefit of the doubt. Um, 
I'm also really interested in seeing what Colson Montgomery and Harry Ford do because they're both they're both highly regarded prospects at shortstop and catcher, respectively. Uh, like in the conversation for the best at their position, mostly in the minors, they've stood out because of their plate discipline. They both reached base at an incredible clip, but the numbers aside from that don't really blow you. Like for for as high end a prospect, for as high end as Colson Montgomery and Harris Harry Ford are among prospects, their numbers aren't like lighting things up in the minors, and they haven't up to this point. So I. I'd like to see them kind of kind of put their best foot forward in the Arizona Fall League so that I can uh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like next year is kind of a make or break season for both. Are they going to are they going to take that next step and become top 10 top 20 overall prospects or are they going to you know, continue to just kind of meander along in the minors? Did you hear oh. Scott almost say Harrison Ford, by the way? Everybody hear that? He yeah. wanted to say Harrison Ford. He's pointing that out. So, Is there no Harrison Ford? It's Harry Ford. Harry Ford, Harrison Ford. Yeah, it's yeah, all the it's same. Kind of the same it name. all works. Scott, you could give us the real reason, and uh, that would be that Colson Montgomery is on your Dynasty League team, and you really mm. want to see what he does here. <laughs> well, I all traded right. for Colson Montgomery. Interestingly, I traded away Harry Ford and Kyle Manzardo in that same team in that same league this year. So all three of the prospects I talked about, yes, I have a, a stake in seeing how things go for them. Uh, some other interesting names we'll quickly run through here. I've got 15 names. I'm going to give you groups of five and you choose one that you think might be interesting here. Uh, Welsh, Gavin Cross, an outfielder with the Royals, Wilmer Flores, a pitcher with the Tigers, Jake Eater, a pitcher with the White Sox. He came over in the Jake Berger trade, uh, Zach Dezenzo, an infielder with the Astros and Max Muncy, a shortstop with the A's. Uh, give me one name, 30 seconds or less you're interested in. Uh, Zach Desenzo is probably the most. I've seen a lot of Gavin Cross. Nah, not into it. Wilmer Flores was actually in the Arizona Fall League before. Eater will be fun, and I've watched Max Muncy. Desenzo, 20, 18 homers, 22 stolen bases, hit over 300 this past year. Big body, one of the last, big body outfield, six foot four, one of the last like real prospects you know they got a couple of them there uh Desenzo is going to be a big hyper focus for me I'm very excited to see him and see you know if that 2020 potential is still really there this next group Scott you're going to get Jacob Berry an infielder with the Marlins uh James Triantos second baseman with the Cubs Alexander Canario who we saw make his debut this year outfielder with the Cubs uh Yvonne Melendez an infielder with the D-backs and Benny Montgomery an outfielder with the Rockies give me one name uh, hmm. <laughs> I, I, I want to say Melendez, but he's on my dynasty league team too. You could say him. It's fine. Yvonne Melendez. He is, you know, kind of one thing I've been, one point I've been making in recent years with the, you know, the, the prevalence of stat cast is that the way a hitter can overcome an exorbitant strikeout rate is by hitting the ball incredibly hard. And Yvonne Melendez is going to push the limits of that theory, unlike any hitter who's come before him. The power right. production is incredible. The strikeout rate is ridiculous. And uh, I'm not sure how it's going to play out. And I don't think the Arizona Fall League will tell us how it's going to play out. But well, it will I tell us because uh, Salt River Fields has stat cast data for every single game and he will be playing there. So we will get data every single time he has an at bat at Salt River. And I will also be there just watching the smoke come off the ball. So I'm excited. <laughs> uh, well, it's just last group includes two pitchers from the Braves, two pitchers from the Cardinals and Robert Hassel. Nationals outfielder, uh, but those names Darius Vines, Dylan Dodd with the Braves, Cooper Jerpy, Takoa Roby with the Cardinals. Give me one name you're excited for. Um, Jerpy, I, I want to see him pitch. Uh, I, you know, I will say Hassel for all the negativity. Like, I want to see if there's anything there. I have a reference point for him, and that is sometimes my crutch. I actually talk about this on my latest prospect one that's coming out here on Friday. I've admitted that for a long time. My, one of my worst crutches in the prospect analysis side is. I do see these guys at a very young age. I build something in my brain of who they are. And sometimes I struggle with coming off of that. And 
I've seen Robert Hassel at a very good spot. I've seen him make a lot of contact. I've seen a guy where it's like, oh, if he grows into his body, this was a very like Bryce Harper-like swing. It all has fallen apart. I want to see what that looks like. Also point out, as far as I was told, he requested to be here. So I think I want to see him. And I don't know if you wrote it in here. I do have like, there's a couple other names I do think people should pay attention to. I don't know if you want to hit those just for a second. Yeah, go for it. Uh, two players very specifically, they're almost top leaderboard at their categories. Abimelech Ortiz with the Texas Rangers, 33 homers this year, 21 years old. He's not the biggest, tallest guy, six foot, around 230 pounds, one minor league player of the year for uh, hitter for the uh, Rangers. He's going to be here. He's going to crush. He's going to absolutely dominate. Look out for him. I don't think he's on a ton of radars, but he was an absolute masher this year. And Victor Scott the second with the Cardinals led minor league baseball with 95 stolen bases this year. An interesting fact, in the top five stolen bases, the guys, all the guys who had the five most stolen bases in the minors, he had more homers than three of them combined. The only guy that f breaks that mold is Jonathan Classe. Jonathan Classe actually had more homers than all four of the top five combined. But a um, little bit of power, nine homers, 24, I think, doubles, some triples. He might not just be a nothing burger on power. He might be like an Estory Ruiz. So Victor Scott and Evabelic Ortiz are guys you're, we're going to want to pay attention to. And that is what is unique. The last thing with the AFL, do you want to like be, do you want to live and die by numbers? No, of course you don't. But getting to like dissect how these guys perform with their peers in these environments is important. And we see things that sometimes don't pop out like the Heston Kerstad stuff. Um, Mervis was a little bit of a, a false nomer, but like we get to see these guys in day in and day out, see how they perform. And it tells us a lot of going into next year when you get to see more than one or two games. And Frank, you're going to get to see some of these guys. And it's just a nice little marker you have in the back of your head of like, this guy might be this person on a stat sheet, but you might see some intangibles in games that can play into what we saw almost 40 AFL players from 2022, the 20. Two AF twenty to twenty twenty two AFL hit the majors this year. That's in a that's a crazy amount. I don't think we'll see with this talent pool that many, but we're going to see a lot of them, and hopefully we can dissect them properly. Since you uh, brought up the name, how, how do you feel about Matt Mervis these days? Um, you know, in the AFL, the thing I was always worried about was he he seemed to get like he was old Spencer Torkelson to me. He got loopy with pitches below his waist, but he had this insane power and stuff. I'm kind of indifferent. I think he's a late bloomery guy. Whenever he figures out what his current problem is with being consistent, which is probably going to be like being a DH somewhere. I think he'll be one of those guys that's like a 26 year old, like break post hype sleeper type of guy. I think he can do what Torkelson is doing. I was right going to say Christian Walker. That's, that's what I was that's thinking. Like first, yeah, Christian Walker. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like he might just need some more seasoning. You might need to see a certain side. I, I think you what you need is an organization that will be very, very hyper-focused on him. I, I also said this on Prospect One. I'm noticing a lot more weighted vests. I was at the Royals today in Strucks. Every single player was weighed, were wearing weighted vests. Kendall George, first round pick, small guy with the Dodgers. They were playing an Instructs game. He had a weighted vest on during the game. It's a tiny little thing, but it is the care that you're putting into prospects for improvement, whether it's the weighted bat stuff that the Red Sox were doing, your weighted vest, all of those things. I think Matt Mervis needs some hand-holding and some serious care, and we can get a Christian Walker, Spencer Torkelson-like return we uh, can. in the future. We, like, that is a feasible scenario, but do you think Matt Mervis is worth the trouble anymore in Dynasty League? I kind of like, do still. I okay. kind of do like worth the troubles of that's an open-ended question. Sure. I mean, it's like, not putting specifics on it, but in a league like we all play in, in the Scott White uh, 24 team league. Yes, I do. I actually, I, think I could keep him for $5. Would you keep him for $5? No, uh, drop him. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> I yeah, I you move him to me, <laughs> but you know what? I might, I think I might just to see where it turns out because like, I have a lot of mental comparisons of Mervis to what I've seen with Spencer Torkelson before. It's just an older-ish guy compared to Torkelson that I do think in the right circumstances, it can work out. And hey, if Bellinger doesn't re-sign, that might put you know the Cubs in a situation where they want to press him a little bit more. Doesn't seem like it, but it might. Mm -hmm. I, In your format, I would hold on to him higher. 12 team leagues, I don't know. Probably, probably not. not, yeah. 
No, well, thanks no. for the fantasy advice, the Welsh. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, don't listen to a word the Welsh said, Scott. You should absolutely get rid of Matt Mervis. Drop him. Put him back in the pool, please. Put him back in the pool. I definitely would not be bidding on him next year if that happens. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, I have the second pick, so I don't. I can't even play in that pool. I'll be. I'll be enjoying uh, Paul Skeens, Wyatt Langford, or Dylan Cruz. So he wouldn't be. An that's option. a that's a different draft. Oh yeah, yeah. That's just same league, different draft. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Again, the Arizona Fall League is starting up next year. I had a bunch of leftovers here on the rundown, but frankly. I don't think that they matter much at this point. Uh, I could bring up a few names and see if you guys have anything on it. Sawyer Gibson Long, he was okay against the Royals. Five innings, two earned runs, six strikeouts there. So if you started him, I think you're mostly okay with what he gave you here. Uh, David Peterson, we mentioned him as a streamer yesterday. If you used him, uh, I don't even know if you got all his stats yet because that game hasn't completed. But seven <laughs> shutout innings with eight strikeouts. Yeah, that will work. Uh, some other pitching leftovers. It, it was so annoying. This time of year, we were talking about this beforehand, Welsh. You know, guys like Sonny Gray, Zach Wheeler, oh. Colvin Burns, limited to just four innings on Thursday. It drives me nuts. Like you look at this, you look at it, and you're like, Zach Wheeler had 67 pitches, and you're like, ugh. And then like Michael Lorenzen came in later, and you're like, come on, and, you know, just seeing it. I said to you guys off air, I was like, in my personal opinion. This is like the most annoying fantasy time of the entire year. It's just guys are moving around in weird lineups and you're getting lower inning. I just don't like it. I did, it just, it's blech. It's blech to me. Yeah. No, some people it. love it. They like the grime of this type of fantasy baseball. It's like, oh, this is where, this is where you can pull out all the stops. And I, I totally see that, but it's just yucky to me. Uh, Chris Sale, who I think entered this start with a 13.5 ERA against the Baltimore Orioles this season. He was okay. Five innings, one run, two strikeouts against them. Uh, Dean Kramer was great. Five and a third shutout. He had eight strikeouts on the other side. Chris Bassett saved his best start of the season for the final start. Seven and two thirds shutout innings. 12 strikeouts with 21 swinging strikes uh, up against the Yankees. And kind of like Lazardo, a, a bit of a rocky up and down year for Bassett. But at the end of the day, 360 ERA, 118 whip. It's pretty good. It's pretty usable there for Good old Chris Bassett. Jordan Montgomery finishing the season strong. Another quality start at the Mariners. Uh, Logan Gilbert was good on the other side as well. Six innings, two runs, five strikeouts for him. Uh, I noticed he used more sliders and splitters in this start, and it worked well. I kind of wonder why he hasn't done that more this season, uh, Logan Gilbert, but it was a good start. Good final start for him. Uh, and then some hitting leftovers. Corbin Carroll stole his 52nd base. He's awesome. We know that. Kyle Schwarber, one for three with his 46th home run. He's still hitting 197. He's going to end the year batting under 200. It's my favorite thing. I'm so excited about it. It is. That's all I've wanted all season. Like, <laughs> I, I, I'm a, if a team is 0 and 12 in the NFL, I want them to lose all the games. I, all I've wanted was Schwarber to have 40 plus homers and not hit 200. And I don't think he can get there unless he just, hits the you know, four for four every single game through the rest of the way. Yeah. It's, it's not going to happen. He, he's no. still getting yeah, 107 runs scored 101 RBI. He's the 17th best outfielder in Roto, the seventh best in head to head points leagues. I, yeah. I want to also point out, like, yeah. I don't remember. I know Joey Gallo has been like this, but the discrepancy of a head to head categories league versus a OBP league is astronomical because he's got like a three last i looked it was like two days ago 343 obp which is still like a pretty good obp yeah. to go with those stats that's a first round type of that's like a matt olsen type of bat in an obp league with an obp that's a little bit lower than usual the discrepancy of who he is and how he hurts you with your batting average versus the obp is just so wild it is like old school joey gallo days yeah it, it really is trey turner went three for four with his 30th steal of the year He's up over 100 runs scored, 26 RBI. So that second half really did a lot to get Trey Turner back on track. And what, what we what we may not have noticed with Trey Turner though is he was two for 25 coming into this game. So yeah, but we don't talk a, about that. Scott. A rough seven start, a rough seven game stretch there. That uh, I don't know. We'll see how that. We'll see how the last negative Nancy goes. over here. Come on, we're, just, we're, we're doing positive just, things. I just you know we need the we need the full spectrum here. The it numbers wasn't, it are, wasn't all roses right up until the very end. That's true. Matt Olson, one for four with his league-leading 54th home run. Uh, what should I spend my winnings on? I was guys? just about to say you're cashing. Well, why don't you bring a little bit of that when you come out here to Arizona, Frank? So uh, uh, that's going to be nice. Let's do it. Uh, also set a the Braves franchise record with 136 RBI. 
and counting. Who knows? Maybe more to come for Matt Olson. And 126 week. runs scored. I, I was looking at his stat line today. I was like, obviously, look, Ronald Acuna, historic season. Mookie Betts, awesome. But like, Matt Olson is going to be third in MVP voting in the National League, uh-huh. right? Or I guess Freddie Freeman's up there too. But uh, Well, yeah. I mean, it's, those are the clear top four. I, I predict it'll be Acuna, Betts, Olson, then Freeman. But uh, but yeah, they, you know, in a different year, any one of them would be a great MVP winner. All right, some quick bullpen updates in case you're looking for saves over the weekend. We had, uh, for Oakland, Trevor May picked up his 21st save. A lot of saves in the second half for uh, Trevor May. For the White Sox, Brian Shaw picked up his fourth save. For the Brewers, instead of going with Devin Williams, they used Ethan Small, who walked two, but picked up his first career save. For the Pirates, David Bednar struck out two for his 38th. For the Orioles, Yanir Cano entered in the eighth inning with a one-run lead. He got two outs, and then he was relieved by Cionel Perez, who got the final out of the eighth inning. And then it was Tyler Wells who uh, picked up his first save of the season. For the Braves, it was Rysel Iglesias who struck out one for his 32nd save. And I don't even want to talk about it because it's going to make me frustrated again. But for the Texas Rangers, Aroldis Chapman got the ninth inning with a one-run lead. He gave up two hits and a walk without getting it out. He was then pulled for Jonathan Hernandez, who got the first two outs of the inning. Last you guys have you guys have no idea how mad Frank was coming into the show. Frank was oh. like, like I was like, like, are you okay, buddy? And like I thought there was going to be so, not that I'm downplaying what was going on, but I thought there was something very serious going on. Frank's like, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and like, and it's all around the world. Aroldis Arold- Chapman is a big reason why uh, I think the, doing this show has turned you around a little bit, Frank. But it was a rough go before the show. Frank was yeah. taking it very hard. J.P. Crawford comes up with the bases loaded against Jonathan Hernandez. It's a two-run <laughs> double to end the game. Uh, mm. Aroldis Chapman takes the loss and gives me negative 10 fantasy points in Tout Wars. And how far behind are you now? I think I'm 14 points behind. So you'd have been four points behind, but now yeah. it's 14. Yeah. And I also bench Ellie De La Cruz. So not looking too good going into the weekend. It's, facing- it's, it's you know, it's, you're, you're within shouting to you're yeah. you're more than within shouting distance. I mean, fourteen points. That's not. I, I I know Scott, but it's just the idea of like I could have been winning if I started Ellie De La Cruz and Aroldis Chapman wasn't Aroldis Chapman. But alas, here we are, <laughs> final in season podcast of the year. That'll do it again. Thank you so much to everyone who's stuck with us all season long. Uh, if you won your league or anything, make sure to give us a five star rating or review on Apple. We really do appreciate it. For and Scott, stick with us through the off season. Heck yeah. For yeah, a lot of fun. Scott and the Welsh. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. And we will be back again after the season next week. Bye bye. <laughs>